Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over the UFC card for this Saturday from a DFS perspective. Um, stay tuned for tomorrow where we do the betting breakdown, but this is going to be strictly from a DFS perspective. For those of you that are watching this, just kind of just stumbling across this, um, if you want to look at more DFS content, um, we do all the different sports on TrueDFS.com. Um, so it was an interesting slate this, this week because we actually had a couple of fights get added and some of them, we really didn't know who was fighting until later on in the week. Um, but we did end up with a 12 fight card after all was said and done. The overall outlook for this slate is that unlike last week, I do expect this week to be extremely low scoring, um, at least lower than last week. Last week, as you'll recall, there were some incredible scoring opportunities that we had to go through when we do we were doing our DFS breakdown from the Bulgarian Bulgarian uh, underdog upside play to you know uh, we talked about AJ Dobson just a lot a lot of guys that we had to get through because it just rated to have a lot of finishes and a lot of grappling upside and all of it and this week I don't believe that to be the case um, but we'll go through kind of fight by fight and deal with this. But the first thing to think about uh, overall is that this is one of those slates where there are two five-round fights. You have two title fights here. And as you guys know, I mean, when you have a five-round fight, it automatically has a projection advantage on the others because, well, I mean, you're getting five rounds. Um, and when you have two fights, that really does put, you know, the question to, to, the, to, the, to the lineup constructor of, of whether to play, whether to play one of them whether to play both of them or do you have the the cojones to uh to fade both of them um some other an analysts of these dfs contests have noted that typically what happens is that you usually get one of the two five round fights uh make the optimal but to me that is just kind of like sample size challenged, you know, and, and it's circumstance challenge. It depends on which, what type of five round fight it is to be able to make a statement like that. So without getting too, you know, too far off the beaten path, let's just go through fight by fight, rely on the numbers and see if we can't figure out what to do here. Um, first fight, you have Silva versus Morose. Now, right off the bat, this is a, this is one of the few, kind of mid-range fights. As a matter of fact, this is the closest lined fight there is as far as DraftKings salary is concerned. You usually get either an 8100, 8100 fight or an 8200, 8K fight. This one is the closest one you, you have. Now, when you compare this to the actual win odds, let me see if you can get any win equity here. Um, actually, I think Silva being priced up at, you know, minus 150, even Vig, Vig uh, adjusted down to minus 135 or so. I think there's a little bit of line value in Silva, maybe a tiny bit, uh, not that big of a deal though. So let's just kind of deal with this and see what type of fight this rates to be, you know, because as I, as I mentioned, as I alluded to, there isn't a lot of upside in some of these kind of mid-range fights this week. You, you obviously you're going to have your 93, $94 fighters that rate to finish and whatever, but we'll get to them. But we have to really struggle to find a lot of upside from these fights. So let's just take a look at the numbers here. First of all, from an inside the distance uh, analysis, you have, uh, what do you have? Silva inside the distance is plus, well, probably by plus 200 when you account for Vig. And that's actually not bad uh, at that price. So I think that even on a slate where you you know, even on a normal slate where you had a lot of upside, I still think that a plus 200 inside the, uh, the distance prop for an $8,300 fighter is perfectly reasonable. Uh, on the other side of this, you have Moreau's inside the distance, which is extremely poor, which is plus 425. So she, to me, would be completely out of play unless she had significant takedown upside. And quite honestly, I think that that Silva might have the bigger takedown upside. Um now it depends on on you know where where you watched, but I have heard some cases made that Moreau's might actually try for takedowns as well. But 
But look at this. I mean, I, if Silva tries to go for her takedowns, she has a takedown upside. If Morose goes for her takedown, she has a takedown upside. And then what we're left with is Silva with the superior inside the distance prop. So every way you look at this fight, Silva would be the side. Um, both from, well, I wouldn't say from a betting perspective. We're not going to deal with that yet. But from a DFS perspective, she is clearly the better side. The only thing that I would suggest with respect to Morose is that if, in fact, Silva turns out to be really popular, then I think that Morose would be kind of decent leverage. But I just don't know if Silva's going to be that popular. Um, you're going to have to check and see updated ownership uh, projections closer to fight time. Because, again, the slate was just kind of put together in the last 24 hours to be finalized. So you're not exactly mm -hmm. sure where the ownership is going to, you know, kind of fly yet. But um, I would think that Silva would get some ownership just because, like I said, there aren't that many mid-range fights that are worth playing here. And so this one is probably one of them. Um, so Silva, I think, is a very, very strong play. I think that Morose is probably a pass unless, like I said, Silva gets extreme ownership, in which case you could play her with, you know, as, as leverage. So what we're going to do as we usually do is let's just start building kind of like our favorite plays here um and see what we're kind of left with at the end all right uh next five we're just going to go up the card here is gerald mearshart no is going to be andrea lee versus natalia silva so here we have a 9400 hundred dollar fighter uh and it's a women's fight and not to be sexist or anything but i, I bring that up only because these fights usually tend to not have the same type of inside the distance upside as the as the male fights of similar prices so we'll go and we'll take a look at it and see if that kind of bears out here. Um, oops, sorry about that. So remember, for a $9,400 fighter, you've got to have an inside the distance prop of well over minus 100, maybe even minus 150. Uh, in addition to that, it would be nice if you had some grappling upside. Um, if you don't have grappling upside, your inside the distance line really needs to be closer tied to the first rounds, right? So you take a look at this and you see Silva inside the distance is only like plus one, 170 maybe, which is extremely poor, you know, for this type of, of price. And unless she has a significant grappling upside, um, it's a really, really poor play. I would actually venture to say that Andrea Lee would be the one to have the grappling upside. That would seem to be her path to victory here. You look at her inside the distance prop. I mean, this is, this is torture. I mean, you just can't play her at all. Um, so the only thing I would be left with is, is, is Andrea Lee worth a bet worth a DFS play here? Okay. The downside is that she only wins the fight one every, you know, three times, pretty much. So only 25% of the time she's going to win. However, I have to say that if, in fact, she wins, I feel as though that it's going to be accompanied by a bunch of takedowns. It just doesn't seem that Andrea Lee is going to win a striking match with Silva here. So I'm not saying that she's going to win once again, but if she wins, I think it is going to be accompanied by, by takedown upside. So what that means is that she's 25% to win, but not only that, but if she wins, I think it's extremely likely that she makes optimal. So in a weird, in a weird fight here, even though Sil to Silva is probably the most expensive fighter on the card, uh, we'll get to maybe we'll get to some others. I think Andrea Lee is probably the better DFS play because um, her matrix support her metrics support her price from a DFS perspective more than De Silva's metrics support her price. Um, so the only thing I would I would I would say caution about the Andrea Lee side is that for everything all the reasons I just mentioned that made De Silva not such a great play, she's probably not going to be I would imagine not that highly owned. So maybe you don't get the same type of leverage, but I think that on her own, I think Lee is a, is a pretty reasonable punt here. So uh, I would I would say that of these two fighters, I would 
I would say that Silva is more of the pass and Lee is more of the play here. So let's let's start with these two. Okay, moving on, we have Andre Petrovsky versus Gerald Mearsart. We have 8,800 versus 7,400. So we're expecting about, about a minus 180, maybe 190 on a card like this. Let's see what these actual odds are. You're actually getting Petrovsky at minus 230. Um, even big adjusted minus 210. So you're not getting any bargain here on your start where it comes to uh to to uh to win on to win odds. Um you can actually make the case that you're getting a little bit of line value on Petrovsky. Um this price usually ah, I shouldn't say that. I was about to usually indicates 9k or higher, but there are just other fighters here with better win odds. Um so in the context of this slate. I think that Petrovsky is pretty reasonable. It's not it's not that great of line value, but when it comes to the the win condition here, I mean this is this is where this fight really stands out. We'll take a look at Petrovsky first. So Petrovsky at only eighty nine hundred, you only really need you know maybe plus one hundred as far as inside distance uh, to be viable, and he is minus one ten. So at minus one ten inside the distance, in and of itself. Petrovsky is a good play, but when you factor in that he has a, a, a ton of wrestling upside as well, I mean, Petrovsky becomes an extremely strong play at that price. Now, on the other side of the, of the, uh, of the fight, though, you have Mearshart, who essentially every, I think every fight that he wins, he wins by finish, which is actually quite amazing. Uh, maybe there are a couple of exceptions, but I don't think so. So you have Mearshart inside the distance here at plus 300. And at that price, that's extremely strong. Okay. So you look at it from a win odds perspective again. So let's say that it's a two to one favorite. Um, if he's if he's two to one underdog, sorry, then he's going to win the fight about 33% of the time. And if he's going to win by by finish almost all of the time, that becomes an extremely strong DFS play. As a matter of fact, I don't quite get this inside the distance. Oh, I get it because they're giving you a no as well. So inside the distance, you see this? For you to bet him inside the distance, you'd get plus 240 or plus 260. If you were going to bet him just to win, the best you'd get is plus 200. So they're very they're, they're modeling for very few variations where he wins and does not get the finish. So, which makes him in a very, very strong DFS play as well. So, I think both of these fighters are extremely strong. Um, he's actually not even 8,900, 8,800. Wow. So, I think right off the bat, this fight is is definitely a key fight. Now, you could make the argument that Petrovsky, knowing that Mearshard is, is very live for submissions, might not be quite as aggressive when he gets on top or anything like that. But... Again, the numbers are the numbers, uh, and I'm not going to fade that. So I think right off the bat, you have the, your first fight that you want to kind of lock in both sides, um, Mearshart or Petrowski. Now, we'll, we'll put Petrowski in here right now, but we might switch this to, to Mearshart a little bit later. But in uh, MME or even in, in 20 max, I would definitely get both sides of this and, and make sure you get it. All right, so you have Brian Katona versus... Uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Cody Gibson. So it, it's, um, you see his fights here. They list them from 2015 because he hasn't really been in the UFC for a long time. You know, he's been in the, um, in, in the, in the lower promotion. So they don't have those listed here. And likewise, when you see Brad Katona, um, you know, these are back in 2019, but already you could see a little bit of, uh, of, uh, of uh, of evidence here of what's going to happen in this fight. Like, look, let's look, let's look at Cody Gibson's his just kind of his results when you factor in all the other fights too. I mean, check this out. This is this is Cody Gibson. You have decision, decision. There's a KO, decision, submission, KO, decision, decision, decision. A lot of decisions. Like two thirds of his fights are decided by decision. And then when you look at Brad Katona, 
You look at his results, decision, 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 decision. Literally, almost every fight goes to decision. So even though there's no inside the distance prop that's listed yet, I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what's going on here. You have two decision fighters, and neither of them are huge wrestlers. So this fight, to me, is in just kind of an easy pass. So we are going to probably end up passing it. Um, all right, so likewise, let's see. You have Hubbard versus Kolobov, which is the other, uh, I forget the name of the series that's ending, the Ultimate Fighter Championship or something like that. So you have Austin Hubbard versus uh, Kurt Holoba. So 8,400 versus 7,800. This is the next kind of middling fight here um, from a, a price perspective. And this is probably much poorer, I would imagine, than the, than the women's fight. Let's just take a look at it just for see what's going on here. So we're going to compare it to the Silva fight, just for example. Like the, the win odds are the same, like 150 or so, 160 versus 145. It's maybe Hubbard's a little bit more expensive um, uh, as far as win odds go, which is accounted for in the line. Let's take a look at the inside the distance lot prop here. We have so we have both of these fighters at plus looks like plus 300 inside the distance. Um, this is kind of like a straight ply, but plus 250. Um, well, Betway is plus 300. These guys plus 250. So it's about plus 300. So in either case, neither fighter is as good as the Sil as the Silva, for, as, as Silva, uh, for example, from that first fight. So I think this fight is pretty poor. I guess Hubbard might have some takedown upside, but I mean, he's the favorite at a plus 350 inside the distance line. In a weird way, I think that the only part of this fight I would even consider is the Holaba side, but even that, I mean, plus 330 for a for a $7,800 fighter, I think is extremely poor. So I think this fight is probably a pass. Okay, Gregory Rodriguez versus Dennis Tululian. Okay, this one actually might be the most, uh, the highest priced fight on the card. And probably for good reason. So you have, first of all, Greg, Gregory Rodriguez is a minus 370 favorite. Even accounting for VIG, you're talking about minus 320. And when you look at the inside the distance prop here, you see that Dennis, that, that Gregory Rodriguez is nearly a two to one favorite to finish inside the distance. And that is just kind of elite stuff, okay? Uh, not to mention, you look at Rodriguez in round one is basically like a plus 150, and that is just kind of elite status. So um, uh, you couple that with the fact that Gregory Rodriguez also has takedown upside, uh, he's got his own takedown expertise, plus uh, Tululian is actually has very poor takedown defense. So you have a style advantage. You have a strong inside the distance prop. It is an extremely strong ninety five hundred dollar play on a very very uh, uh, on a very low scoring slate. I would imagine. So this is probably something you really want to get to. Now the other side of this of this fight though has been getting a little bit of love for this reason. See, Gregory Rodriguez in his last fight came in as a decent sized favorite and he got knocked out in the first round. And I know what people are thinking. They're saying, oh, well, all that's gotta all that's gotta happen is that same thing happens in this fight, and I'm gold, and I'm gold at six at 6,800. Um, just because he got knocked out in his last fight, it really doesn't even make him that much more likely to get knocked out in this fight. It, it's just a little bit, it's just not exactly the same thing. Now Tolulian. Again, he's kind of a, a guy that will go for it, so to speak. But you have to give Rodriguez a little bit of credit for some fight IQ here. And coming off of a loss, I think that there's very little chance that he puts himself in, in harm's way. You know, I, I think that he's going to be well inclined to just, just overwhelm him, take the guy down, submit him in the first round or something like that. So, um Tolulli, in a weird way, I think he's actually going to be overowned at the end of the day. I think people are going to take a shot on him. 
The only reason he might not be over-owned is because I think Rodriguez could be really owned. <laughs> um, and to play devil's advocate, one reason Rodriguez is tough to be over-owned is because there's very few underdogs that you really, really want to play. So overall, uh, I do think that Rodriguez is a very, very strong play, and I'd like to try to get him in, if at all possible. So let's put him in. And when you think about it, remember that we put Petrovsky as our main um, uh, side over here, but if we wanted to flip this to Mearshar, it really does open us up. Now, again, this lineup already has, like, Andrea Lee, who's going to be, I think, going to be extremely low-owned here. So if you're playing a lineup based on ownership, I don't think if you worry too much about it, uh, having Andrea Lee. But I think Rodriguez is, to me, clearly the best, well, certainly the best three-round fight opportunity on the uh, on the slate when it comes to DFS. All right, um, moving on, we have Chris Weidman versus Brad Tavares. So we have Tavares at 9K and Weidman at 7,200. So we're expecting to see, you know, Minus 250, something like that. And we will take a look. We have, yeah, about that. About that. But, I mean, he is, his win odds are no better than, actually, he's like minus 250. So they are a little bit better than Petrovsky. So it looks as though this fight is being lined pretty well uh, from a DFS perspective uh, relative to the win odds. There's no real equity there. So we have to think about this. So if you want to play Brad, Brad Tavares at 9K, what do you need? Well, you need an inside the distance prop of about minus 110 or grappling upside. He does not have the grappling upside here. So we're just going to be needing a an inside the distance prop of about one, minus 110. And it looks as though he comes up a little bit short. So Tavares, his inside the distance line is about plus 140. So I think he comes up as 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 a fringe play at best. Um, the other thing is that you are seeing a lot of talk about how you know Chris Weidman is done, and again, that's just not something that you say. The fact is, I mean, these these odds are what they are. You know, and if he's done, then that's all factored into the line already. You know, and if he's done, this KO prop is factored into the line already. Um, so. Uh, I don't think Tavares is a particularly good play at all. When it comes to Weidman, his, he has a terrible inside the distance prop, but um, he does have takedowns as a very possible path to victory. Um, so this fight, to me, reminds me a little bit of the Andrea Lee fight in that it's very unlikely that Chris Weidman wins. I mean, he only wins, what, 30% of the time? But if, in fact, he wins, I just don't think it's going to be because he strikes with the dude. I think it's going to be because, listen, he's been out for a while. He had a broken leg from, from engaging in a kicking in a kicking uh, fight or whatever. It just happens sometimes. And he's back after all this time. I think that, that coming back, wrestling would be a probably a really really smart idea and so what that means again i don't mean i don't know if that means he's going to win but what i do think is that if in fact he does win i think it's going to be accompanied by some takedowns so i actually think that weidman is a very reasonable uh underdog uh dfs wise on the slate as a matter of fact i do think that he is a better dfs play than the uh than the favorite in this particular uh in this particular fight the only thing and I was about to say that what, what sometimes draws me away from him, guys like this, is because of name value. But here you kind of have reverse name value. Like these older guys, people just never play because they just presume they're done. Uh, I, I will. I would like to re remind everybody of last week when Cub Swanson was done, and this was his retirement fight, and he found a way. You know, these guys have been around for a long time. Chris Weidman had a had a long undefeated run back when he was listening. I, I you know what I think about I think about that scene from Moneyball where they were uh, where uh, the Billy, Billy Bean was interviewing or Brad Pitt as Billy Bean was talking to, uh, to whoever was playing David Justice and he was saying, "Listen, I'm not paying you for the for the hitter you used to be. I'm paying you for the hitter you are now." And likewise, I'm not. I don't care that Weidman is not the way he used to be. All I'm saying is that he's a two-to-one underdog that if he wins, 
he's probably going to score decently. So I think that he's very reasonable here uh, from a DFS. All right. Uh, oops. That. So we're 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 bit, we're playing some pretty contrarian plays this week, which I, I'm kind of liking. Because what I've been having to do the last, you know, several weeks is kind of force in contrarianism by, well, I'll do that some other time. I'll talk, I'll talk to you guys about how to do that in kind of a later video. Maybe on my live stream, I'll do that. But I've been having to use like different Sabre Sim uh, lineup uh, constraints, different uh, methods of, of, of ranking the, the lineups, whether it be by ownership fade or whatever. Anyway, uh, moving on, we have, Pedro Munoz versus Marlon Vera. We have Vera, who is 8,600. Munoz, 7,600. So we're expected to be about a minus 160-ish, the way the distribution plays out on this slate. And that would be about right. Whoa, that is not about right. So you have Vera at a minus 210. Boy. Vera at 210, we're going to compare that to some of these others. See if there's any line discrepancy. There's actually, nobody was actually 210. You had Petrovsky was like 230. You had Silva is 150. You had Hubbard at minus 180. So there's really no direct comparison. So I guess this is somewhat fair. Let's just let's look at this second. So Vera is more than Hubbard as he should be. He's less than um what's his name? Uh Petrosky, like he should be. So I guess he's 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 aligned pretty, you know, pretty decently. So there's no real line value there. So 8600, what we're looking for is basically plus mm, one. 40 inside the distance, maybe, for uh, for Vera. Let's take a look at him first. Vera inside the distance is, is, is an atrocious plus 330. So he's just a terrible play. He also doesn't have any takedown upside. So Vera is out of play here. Let's take a look at Munoz. Munoz inside the distance is, is abominable. He's like plus 1,000. The only thing is, is that there's a case to be made that Munoz has some takedown upside, but it's it's more it's it's mostly illusory. Uh, in that, if in fact he went for takedowns, he would have a big advantage and probably win. But it just hasn't gone for them, you know. So you have to have that parlay of him deciding to go for takedowns and them working. So. I think that the whole fight is probably a pass, but if we were going to play one fighter, it would probably be Munoz. That would be my take on this fight. All right, you have Mario Batista versus Damon Blackshear. So this is a, a unique situation where Blackshear is, is coming in off of literally seven days' notice. I'm not even, like six days' notice or whatever, because he fought last Saturday. He was an extremely strong play last week, um, and he did not disappoint. He he submitted the dude in the first round, cashed everybody's tickets. Okay. Now he's fighting Mario Batista. This is a much more difficult situation because the reason why Blackshear was such a great play last week was because, or what, why he was such a, his win odds were so strong as well, was that he had an extreme style advantage. I mean, he had extreme takedown upside. And his opponent, Jose Johnson, had extremely poor takedown defense. And in this particular fight, that's just simply not the case. Okay, and That's why now he's like a plus 180. So where are we here in this fight? You know, let's let's first take a look at the at the price. And I'm pretty sure it's pretty, pretty tight. Yeah, 9,100, 7,100 is fine. Um, but here here's the thing. All right. Again, I don't know if 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 Blackshear is going to win. But I promise you, I promise you, if in fact he does win, which is going to happen, you know, 33% of the time, it's going to be because he gets takedowns. Like he's not going to, he's not going to get involved in a, in a striking match here. You know, think about this. He, he's, 
he's done well in his last three fights by taking the guy to the ground. I mean, that, that's what he's going to try to do, you know? So uh, I think that Blackshear, even though it's like fundamentally seems to be a terrible play, right? He doesn't have that same style advantage. He's on the six days notice as opposed to last week where he's fighting the guy who his, his, his opponent was on the six days notice. It seems like an atrocious play, but listen, the numbers are what they are. And if he's going to win this fight 33% of the time, I mean, he's going to score well 33% of the time. So I think that this is a pretty reasonable underdog here. Um, and Batista, he's got a decent amount of finishing upside as well and, uh, on his own. And because of his style advantage here, I mean, he gets he gets to play the submission game. You know, if, with Black, with Blackshear probably going for all these takedowns, Bautista could get the back and get him out of there pretty quickly. So I think both of these fighters are pretty strong, but I would definitely play both of them. And I think I feel that Blackshear is a pretty, pretty decent underdog here as well. All right, uh, moving up, we have uh, Ian Gary versus Neil Magny. So you have this. Now, this is the highest priced fighter on the card. You have Ian Gary at 9,600. So that's probably going to work out to be a minus 350 or something like that. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's even bigger than that. He's a minus 500. It's only that price because they really can't make it any higher. Um, but let's think about this for a second. So for a $9,500 fighter, what do you need? Remember, we talked about this in terms of uh, Gregory Rodriguez. You needed a, not only an inside the distance prop of about at least minus 150. You could have either minus 150 inside the distance prop or minus 110 plus a ton of upside as far as grappling goes. Remember Rodriguez, he was minus 210 inside the distance plus wrestling upside, plus he was plus 160 inside the first round. You look at Ian Gary by comparison, he, inside the distance, is not even favored. Actually, that's not true. He is favored. He's minus one, he's minus 130 or so inside the distance. Compare that to the minus 210 of Rodriguez. That's a big difference. And also considering that Gary does not really have the takedown upside, um, makes him a significantly worse play, in my opinion, than Rodriguez. Um, even you look at his round one, his round one is plus, when you account for big, plus 210. So overall, it's very simple. Well, it's not that simple. I mean, Rodriguez is just a better play. He just is. Um, not to mention that from a style perspective, and I'm actually probably double saying the same thing twice, that Maggie's a guy that'll just kind of just kind of wear on you a little bit. It's kind of tough to get him out of there really in the first round, unless you were who, like Shemaev or somebody got him got him out of the first round, somebody like that. But aside from that, I mean, I don't know. This guy's been around the block, Magni. To get him out of there in the first round, I mean, that's what you're gonna need if you play if you play if you play a Ian Gary. You have to get him out of there in the first round. And Gil oh, Gilbert Burns and Shockma got him out in the first round. Well, Yakim Silva, this is this is a grappling match or whatever. Um, so I don't know. The one thing I would say is that for leverage or as a, a, a pivot off of Rodriguez, yes, obviously you could play him. But aside from that, he's definitely a worse play. Like, for example, I bet you could you could play both, right? If you played, like, for example, I mean, look at look at all these underdogs that we have. Like you, you could play. Where's Ian Gary? You could play Ian Gary with very little issues if you use some of these underdogs that we put, that we came up with. But in and of himself, I mean, he's definitely a worse play than than Rodriguez. Uh, on the other side, you have Magny, and the problem here is that if Magny, even if Magny wins, he's not guaranteed to be in the optimal because his style. It's not exactly just take down, take down, take down. It's more just kind of like wearing on you up against the cage, in the clinch, just making the fight awful. And yeah, I mean, at his price, maybe that's just kind of going to be good enough. But the problem is he just doesn't win often enough. You know, he's th this fight is like plus 400. You know, that that's, that's a big deal. I and mean, he only wins this fight 20% of the time. 
that's just not going to be good enough unless I was damn sure that he was going to be optimal if he won. And if I was damn sure that Gary would be really popular, which I don't think he will be, you're going to have the main event will be really popular. You'll have Rodriguez will be really popular. You'll have Petrosky, I think, will be really popular. So I don't even think Gary's going to be that highly owned, even though he's a huge favorite to win. So I don't think playing Magny is really worth it. So then you have Sterling. Uh, well, you have the two main event fights. You have Wei Li Zhang against Amanda Lemos. Um, let's look at this one first, I guess. So she's a minus 300 favorite. Uh, and her price is 9,200. So her price is, is fair. Before, without even looking at the inside the distance line, she's she's got, she's got grappling upside in five rounds to implement it. I mean, this is just a very difficult spot to fade um, because of those five rounds. Um, and then when you look at the inside the distance prop as well, I mean, it's probably a minus 110, right? Even better, it's like minus 140 inside the distance. Now, that doesn't mean she gets out of in the first round, but the combination of her grappling upside plus her finishing upside plus five rounds. I mean, this is this is a this is a obviously a very very strong play. So I mean, let's 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 put her in. We got we got room actually, right? We got room. Put her in. Boom. You play three studs here. What do you play four? No, I guess you can't do that. Um, and Limosh on the other side. I mean, yeah, sure. You know, she she's going to win the fight, again, 25% of the time. I'll tell you, when she wins, she's going to be optimal because I think because she's either going to get a KO or at the very least, she's going to be leveraged off of a very popular fighter. So I think both sides of the main of this main event, the co-main event is are fine. And then pretty much the same thing in the main. You know, you have Sterling, who is a minus 260, He's actually being priced pretty reasonably at 8,900. They're very similar to Petrosky, right? Petrosky was 8,800, and his price tag was about was minus 240. So Sterling is actually a very strong play, even compared to Petrosky. And he's got all the grappling upside and the control time and 140 points in a decision type thing. He's just an elite play who's going to be sickly popular. And on the other side, you have O'Malley, who, once again, if he wins, it's going to be either a KO or five rounds of striking against a very popular fighter. So uh, he's going to be in play as well. So all four prongs of this main event, of these two main events, are very, very viable, almost forced. Uh, and in addition to that, just to kind of go over it, Gary, I don't need it. Magni, you don't need it. Uh Bautista and Blackshear, maybe, but Blackshear for sure, a decent underdog. Uh, Vera Munoz fade. Weidman, sneaky underdog. Tavares fade. Rodriguez, elite play. No need to play Tulian, I don't think. Um, Hollowbutt Harvard fade. Katona Gibson fade. Petrosky, Mearshar, probably key fight. Andrew League, sneaky little underdog. Uh, and probably Kareem Silva. Um, that should do it. Uh, stay tuned for the betting breakdown, which is going to be coming tomorrow. And good luck on uh, this uh, very, very tricky card.